Thanks a lot, Horace, for joining me today on the Arjuna Watch podcast. Uh, uh, it is my great honor to welcome Horace Josh. He's a great guy who's done some really cool things. And I'm hoping all of you guys will enjoy listening to uh, some of the questions I'll have for him today. So a quick introduction. His LinkedIn profile confirms that he's also the AI lead at a local company in Melbourne called Envision Systems. Finished his degree at Monash uh, in the electrical and computer systems stream way back in 2010, after which he started his PhD again at Monash from 2011 to 2015. But more coolly than that, even as he just started his PhD, he won Best Student Paper Prize at the Bio Devices 2012 International Conference for a paper titled Mobile Real Time Simulator for a Particle Visual Prosthesis. Finally, he finished his PhD in 2015, and the title of that PhD was Real Time Hardware Vision Processing for a Bionic Eye. So that's all very, very cool. As cool as that sounds, uh, Horace is also a fan of uh, uh, fast superbikes which is uh, something I just found out on his Facebook. Welcome, uh, Horace, once again to the uh, Arjuna Watch podcast. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks, Gaurav. Uh, thanks for having me. And that's a very kind introduction. Uh, it's a real honor. This is the first time I'm doing a uh, an interview on my podcast. So to have somebody like you is, uh, is really, really cool. So Horace was my, um, tutor and lab, uh, instructor for a course in computer systems where we did a lot of work with, um, FPGAs. Now, for those of you, uh, who've been watching this podcast, you'll find links popping up right now on your screen for, uh, the episodes I did on that. But uh, I'm hoping in this talk today, we'll go a little bit deeper into the kind of stuff that we did. Apart from asking Horace uh, questions about uh, things that he enjoys doing. So my first question to you, Horace, uh, is uh, that what is the uh, last really cool project that you've been up to? Okay. Um, so the most recent project, I guess, uh, externally to Monash, so this is with Envision Systems, is uh, implementing a uh, video analytics sensor, IoT sensor. So um, once again, I was the AI lead for that. So we were using machine learning to detect and track pedestrians so that we could do counting um, and other <clears throat> statistical analysis uh, on the movement of pedestrians in a certain area that the camera overlooks. Do you want so to I tell us was... uh, very quickly about uh, your 2015 uh, achievement? Yeah, so my PhD was titled Real-Time Hardware Vision Processing for a Bionic Eye. So um, my work in that uh, was to research and develop algorithms that could be implemented on an FPGA-based system um, for use with uh, visual prosthesis. So the work was part of the Monash Bionic Eye project. So they're looking to implement or they are developing uh, a brain implant that will restore some level of vision to people that are blind. Um, so that implant will go on the visual cortex, which is at the rear end of your brain, um, with electrodes that simulate the brain surface to elicit spots of light in your visual field. Okay, so um, so the focus was on low latency implementation and high frame rate. So part of that work, I also developed a visual simulator that um, shows to normally sighted individuals what it might look like to someone that would have this implant. So actually, 
So that obviously means that I should be asking you about what really excited you while you were a student, right? So to, to work all the way till here and complete this kind of amazing work. As an undergrad student, what really excited you? For me, the motivation was when I did my final year project. Uh, so the work I did in my final year project sort of led into what I chose to do for my PhD. Because you haven't done the unit that covers that stuff doesn't mean that you can't actually go into that field, right? right? So I know that my, my brother and sister is back Back in India, we we also look at, you know, a lot of these things, a lot of these topics. I, I recollect uh, courses design where students look into FPGAs, but but Horace, you know, the pedagogy is so different uh, in between these two countries. So it'll be cool to to find out from you um, uh, just a few things about FPGA board. We guys use the Terasic. Uh, B E2 board. Again, uh, I covered this in my earlier podcast. I'm going to be throwing a couple of really uh, silly questions at you only because uh, it's, it's, it's like when you look back at what you've done and you start to really appreciate what you did. I want to ask you the first question about the B E2 board that we looked at. Now, I know it has a cyclone chip in it, and that's the FPGA. Uh, but does that board, what else does that board have? Does that board, for example, have its own uh, processor? And the reason I'm asking you that is because I remember one of the first uh, labs that we did had us instantiating a processor uh, in the lab, which I thought was like one of the coolest things I've done. But does the D2 board come with its own processor and what would its function be? Um, so the D2 development board does not actually come with its own um, typical processor. So the processor that we used in in that lab on those units uh, is a soft core processor. So what that means is the FPGA chip um, it contains a lot of logic blocks that are reconfigurable, which you can configure via uh, a hardware description language, which you use Verilog. So uh, um, alternatives might be VHDL. Um, but that soft core processor is something that's defined purely in hardware description language. So it's a reconfigurable processor that's implemented using the logic blocks that are in the FPGA chip. Oh, really cool. So like literally you are, you're making the system up, like you're, you're, you're building it up. From, there is nothing else that's controlling What's happening on the board is literally what you write on your HDL. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the case of that processor, though, that is a an IP block that's provided by Altera. So you have a tool um, which is now called QSIS that you can use to construct the processor that you want. So we'll start off with a basic system um, standard type of uh, processor level. So there are three different levels in that NEOS processor. Um, and so the simplest one, which will be the economy version, would have the least number of logic elements used, but you can add on certain functions to it um, that would uh, complement the, the basic processor setup. Three configurable blocks mm -hmm. that are present on a Terrasic D2 board, the kinds we used. Now, also last semester, I had a chance to do uh, another really cool subject, a course on sensors where we use something called PSOC, uh, um, or at least the understanding that I'm still gaining about this is that it's also basically reconfigurable in, in the sense that it has things you can drop, drag and drop, and you can connect them in any way, which way you want. But those, but those blocks are, uh, are they, are they analog? And is this, is that a domain that's different from the domain we worked in, which, which was like a bit, the microprocessor digital domains, is there a difference between these two? Um, so with the PSOC, it's, you can think of it as a processor that has an inbuilt FPGA. Okay, so it's, it's the combination of the two things. Um, so using the FPGA part of it, you can offload some of the processing tasks from the microcontroller processor itself to dedicated or reconfigurable blocks part of the FPGA section. Um, 
So that particular FPGA, I believe, has uh, the common logic elements, which are all digital, but it also has some dedicated analog uh, circuitry in it as well. Right. So, like when you would when you when you pull in like an op amp, you're, you're pulling in a, an analog domain device. Is, it, is that a correct? correct. Way to put it? Yes, that's correct. So um, that block would be it, it's it's a hard circuit within the uh, FPGA section. However, um, all FPGAs have a reconfigurable interconnect. Okay, it's often called a switch fabric. So that can be connected up to the micro microcontroller section of the PSOC in different ways. Yeah. What would be an example of, uh, so like an example of a digital reconfigurable block would be uh, like gate, like a... Yeah, so at, at the lowest level, a, a logic element on an FPJ would implement some low level logic gate, as like an AND or an OR, XOR, things like that. Those simple logic blocks together, you can create more complex functions such as multiplexes, comparators. So I think we covered uh, covered most of the questions really that I had for you, Horace. Uh, but I think you've given us a little bit more, a little bit more of a flavor of your own journey. So the one thing I caught today was how your PhD built on the work that you did in your final year, even, even in countries where there is more of a less of a hands-on approach to studies. I know that it, it is stressed that students do a final year project. Like if you were to look back and say things that I could have done differently, and therefore, how could we as students at, at, who are still in our undergrad, what, could we, uh, what advice would you have? Um, <laughs> I know that's a really big question. But. No, that, that, that's all right. Um, I think for, for me, I think the best way I found to learn was to put things into practice. Um, I think when you set out to actually go ahead and build something from scratch, you quickly find out what you don't know. Yeah, there's just a lot of satisfaction from getting something working that you've built on your own. Right? Finally, but the PhD was something that sort of happened naturally for you then, was it? Like, it was just, like you said, your PhD was an extension of FYP, so. Yeah, for me, uh, look, personally, I, I when I finished my undergrad, uh, I didn't think I was ready to go out into industry and work just yet. Um, so I, I thought about other pathways that I could take. So I thought about doing some postgraduate studies. Initially, I thought about doing just the masters. Um, but then after some discussions with my final year project supervisor and uh, with my family and friends, I decided to go ahead for um, going through with the PhD. Can you envision the other part for students who might who might not be as inclined to to go back into academics from mm -hmm. experiences maybe with your other friends who did in fact try their luck out in the industry immediately after the undergrad can you envision that that route what would have what would you have done if you you've gone yeah. down that way yeah so i mean for me my interests lie more in sort of programming and uh, the mix between hardware and software. So I, I think I would have looked for probably some kind of embedded um, programming jobs or roles um, that had a bit a bit of hardware in it as well. So something tangible um, that, yeah. Um, I think it's good to, to try things and then uh, if you don't like it, think about what you, what you might like and then go for that, even if it means changing completely. Your key message here was, you know, to stay hands-on. And that's certainly something that students the worldwide, back in India, can even try to emulate from you. So thanks so much for all of that. Thanks so much for sharing your journey. Thanks so that's much okay. for your advice. Um, yeah, I, I hope I answered your questions well and um, I provided something useful for you. So, this has been great. Uh, my first uh, interview, and that too with a PhD student from Monash, was an absolute honor. With that, um, with that, this uh, this is an end to another episode of the Arjuna Wash podcast. Uh, thanks everybody for listening, and we'll see you again uh, in another episode. <laughs>